guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefine Horizons, and in this video I want to go over what I call a resolved boundary matrix. This is a tool that will help you understand what you need to do to properly resolve a boundary. It will also help you if you're estimating boundary survey work to understand what needs to go in your fee estimate. That, that is sometimes a, a challenge, so this tool will help you with that. I do not take credit for this idea. Uh, this is an idea that I was introduced to, I think it was by a surveyor online in a forum. And I apologize, I don't remember who it was. But it's something I thought a lot about and, and kind of tried to flesh out of my own head a little bit. And it's something that I wanted to share. So the Resolve Boundary Matrix is a tool to help you properly resolve, a boundaries, uh, re resolve the boundaries of a parcel. It has three layers. It has, you have the subject parcel or parcels. You have the adjoiner parcel or parcels, and you have the limits of controlling elements. And each of those things has a different footprint. We're going to look at that. We're going to do a couple of examples. We're going to do a lot block example, and we're going to do a public land survey system example. And I'm going to show you each of these, how each of these would look in these examples and how that might impact your fee estimate. So a lot of guys don't do this. There's a lot of crummy surveyors in the world, and a lot of those guys do not understand the resolve boundary matrix. What they do is they do deed staking. Deed staking is no bueno. Uh, it's a good way to lose your license, and it's a it's a terrible harm to the public potentially, and a, and a black eye on the profession. So let's just real quick explain what deed staking is. Deed staking is when you take your client's deed and you basically put it in the ground, put that deed on the ground using only the information in that deed. So you're not looking at any of the adjoiner deeds. You're not looking at the limits of the controlling element. So you find these two monuments. This is your client's parcel. You find these two monuments. You put the rest of the boundary in with bearing and distances. Maybe you don't find these two back corners. You might not even check this bearing and distance in the back. Maybe you just set your gun up here. You shoot this. You turn this angle. Go down the record distance. Plop in your corner. Do the same thing. Sit here. Backside this. Turn the record angle. Go down the distance. Plop that corner. You never check it across the back. And deed stickers are... You know, they're notorious for taking shortcuts. Don't do that. Use your resolve boundary matrix. Figure out what you actually got to put on the ground. Okay, so this will make some more sense with some examples. Okay, but what you need to do here is you need to look at your subject parcel. You need to look at your adjoining parcels. And then you need to look at the limits of the controlling elements. The... <laughs> Excuse me, one of the reasons you need to look at your adjoining parcels, you need to see if, if you've got common controlling calls along the boundary that your subject parcel shares with the adjoining parcels, or if, if you have conflicting calls or gaps and overlaps in the record measurements. So let me explain that. If your parcel calls a fence, an old fence, then you hope the neighbor next door or their deed also calls a fence. If your deed calls a fence, and the fence is at the top of the of the bank of the creek, and your neighbor's deed calls the center line of the creek, you got a problem there. Those are conflicting controlling calls. You need to know that. You never know that if you don't look at your neighbor's deed. If your deed says 100 feet from this corner, the corner on the north, and the neighbor's deed says 100 feet from the corner on the south, so 200 feet total, and you've only got 198 feet in, in between those two corners, then you got a problem. That's an overlap in the record. It could be a gap, too. Okay, so that's why you got to look at adjoining parcels. And we'll talk some more about con controlling elements. So let's look at an example. We're here in the Blake Boy subdivision. Okay, and we get hired to survey lot two of block eight of the Blake Boy subdivision. So this is our subject parcel right here okay, in pink diagonal hatching. Okay, that's layer one. Okay, so this is what we actually have to put on the ground. Okay. Then we have our adjoining parcels. What are our adjoining parcels? Let's mark those in a different color. Okay, so in this case, we're going to have lot one is an adjoiner, right? Lot three is an adjoiner because we touch right here, kitty corner. Lot four is an adjoiner. Okay, lot five and six, they are not our adjoiners, so they are not in this layer. Okay, now, you could also reasonably say at least some portion, at least half of this adjoining right away in these two streets, okay, that is also in layer two of the resolved boundary matrix, the RBM. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's draw this out. And I encourage you to do this, list this out if you're a new boundary surveyor. So you're just gonna, you're gonna list out your layer, the elements of each layer of the matrix. So what goes in the subject parcel layer? Well, in this case, lot two of block eight. Okay, might have more than one. 
subject parcel. You might be surveying lot two and lot four, but in this case we're just doing lot two. Okay, then you have your adjoining parcels layer of the RBM. Let's list what's in that. Okay, so in this case we got lot one. My board's too short. We got lot one, lot three, lot four. Okay, we have a portion of Blake Street. And a portion of Boy Avenue. Now you might ask, well why, why is Landon putting the adjoining right away in there? So I have two things to say about that. One is, if these streets were dedicated by D, you better get those deeds. And in this case, they're probably not, because we were in a subdivision, they were probably dedicated on the sub map, but you better find out. And if somebody's come in and done surveys at just the road right away, that happens. Sometimes jurisdictions will do that. You better get copies of those surveys, because you want to see if they conflict with the subdivision map. Okay? If there's retracement surveys that conflict, you want to know that. That's why I put those in there. Don't just ignore your, your road right away, street right away. You need to think about it for longer than five seconds. All right. So if we had to draw, let's draw the footprints of our layers. Okay, so here's the subject parcel footprint. Okay. Here's the footprint of our adjoining parcels. Those two shapes, that's what we got to worry about, right? Okay, so that takes us to our limits of controlling elements. The limits of controlling elements are essentially what elements are there that control the location of your lot and the adjoining lots. And you need to look at them both. And those are monuments or senior lines or other surveys that you need to be able to locate on the ground to figure out where your parcel is or, or to check for conflicts or gaps and overlaps with the adjoiners. So let's look at this example here and say we found four original subdivision monuments, controlling original subdivision monuments at the corner of block eight. What is then the limits of the controlling elements? It's this block, right? We're going to be bounded by those four monuments. So even though lot five and lot six aren't in our adjoining parcels, they are in our limits of controlling elements. We've got to come down here and look for these two corners. Okay, that's kind of the best case scenario. I'm assuming here that these interior lot corners didn't get set. Let's just say, for the sake of education, that the city comes in and they put new pavement and sidewalks on Blake Street and they blow out these four monuments. They don't do monument preservation. I know that never happens. Okay, think about how that changes our limits of controlling elements. It doesn't change layer one and two. The subject parcel is the same, the adjoining parcels are the same. But now we got to come all the way up here to the north corners of block seven to look for these two original corners to be able to successfully prorate, right? Prorate in these lots, right? If you remember from what you learned, what you guys have learned about simultaneously created parcels, you got to go up to the next controlling monument as a general rule, the next original monument. Okay, so what do we just do there? If these are gone, what do we just do to our limits of controlling elements? We doubled it times two because the city was kind enough to blow out those monuments. Now let's think about what that means if you're estimating this work. You might be thinking, well, Landon, how do I know that before I do my field survey? The answer is you don't. You don't know. So you got to decide how do you handle that risk. You can phase the boundary survey. You can tell the client we're going to go out and do an initial day of field work. And then when we see what we got on the ground, we'll come back and give you an estimate to finish. Uh, a lot of clients don't like that. So you may have to take all that risk on yourself. And then you just got to know, hey, we might have to go a whole nother block to get this done properly if we don't find these four monuments. Right? And if you're going to come up here and survey this block, I would say if you're doing your job right around these two blocks, you need to shoot all the curb, right? And shoot some interior occupation fences or walls or buildings on these interior lot lines to make sure they're fitting your, your prorated lot lines uh, reasonably. So you just, you know, double the work of the boundary survey if you're missing these four mods here. Right? So you want to think about that. Okay, so again, it's hard to estimate, but you need to be aware of it, and you need to figure out how you're going to allocate that risk and uncertainty with your client. And if they want you to take all the risk, you need to charge them more money. Okay, and then if you come out here and you find four corners, great. Now, something you can do before you go out and do the field work is you can pull, do your land records research. If somebody was out here 20 years ago and found all four of these, 
and you know the road hasn't been paved in 20 years, you know, then maybe you roll the dice on it. You know, see when the last time was somebody surveyed that area and found those corners, right? If, if you pull this, this is an old subdivision map, and these are redwood hubs, right? And this is a 90-year-old subdivision, and you know for a fact the city's been in here and paved and put in trenched underground utilities and put sidewalk in multiple times. Uh, you're probably hosed. You know, might you might be splitting curbs. You might be going a long way to find original monuments. So you need to think about what your limits of control are now. I kept this, try to keep this example simple. If you've got some retracement surveys in here that you feel are reliable, that's going to have an impact on your limits of control. Maybe you don't have to go all the way up. So I don't want to overly complicate this, but let's just say these got blown out and then a good surveyor, you know, came in and he, he set these four corners and uh, he, you know, he shows occupation on a survey and he shows how things fit. Well, then you don't got to go all the way up. You can use his two corners and per rate from there. In fact, that might be a better solution. But think about your limits of control. Okay, so if we had to list the limits of control, I don't have room to write them, but let's think about what they are. Southeast corner of block eight, south, uh, southeast corner of block eight, southwest corner of block eight. If these are gone and we don't trust this guy's retracement survey, northeast corner of block seven, northwest corner of block seven. That's your elements of your limits. Of controlling elements. Okay. All right. So let's look at one more example, then we'll wrap the video up. So I want to do a public land survey example, and then I'll talk about why guys mess public lands up all the time because they're not thinking about their limits or controlling elements. Okay. So we're going to be working in section 23. It's my favorite section. If you ever meet me at a conference or other event one day, buy me a taco, and I'll tell you why section 23 is my favorite. Chris Niemer knows why. So we're in section 23, okay? So here's our section corners. Then we've got our quarter corners. Okay, we got our intersecting quarter section lines. And then we are hired to survey The north half, the northeast quarter of 23. So the north half of the northeast quarter of, sorry, messed that up. It's getting to be the end of the day, you can tell. Northeast quarter of section 23, township one north, range 70, east Mount Diablo baseline of Meridia. Okay, so we get hired to survey the north half of the northeast quarter. That's our subject parcel. That is layer one of the RBM. Okay, now let's think about for a second what our joiners are. Okay, so this whole, let's just say this sub, these three quarter sections haven't been divided any further, they're still quarters. Okay, well, this is an adjoiner then, isn't it? And this isn't a, nope, this is not an adjoiner. Sorry, these two are not adjoiners, these two quarters, because they don't touch, but this is an adjoiner. Okay, so if we were writing our list of adjoiners, we've got the northwest quarter of section 23, and the south half of the northeast quarter of section 23 are our adjoiners. Now, you also got to look on the other side of the section line, section lines, right? So let's just say we got another quarter up here, okay? So we've got the south east quarter of whatever section that is above 23, and no, I don't know by art. <laughs> I don't do enough public lands work. And uh, we've got this northwest quarter of this section on the other side. Those are also adjoining parcels. you got to at least look at them. You want to pull these deeds at a minimum and make sure that they're calling out these same aliquot lines that your parcel's calling out. Okay. If this deed starts at a corner here and goes bearing a distance around the, the quarter with no calls for the aliquot lines, you could have a gap or an overlap here in the record. Now you may say, well, that's not important if the corners are in the ground. Well, it's important if you're doing a land title survey. You better show that on a land title survey, right? The gap and overlaps in the record can be important depending on what you're doing. So you needed a minimum to pull these deeds, okay? 
Now, let's just say the client calls you up and says, oh, hey, I just bought my parcel's neighbor's parcel next door, so I need you to survey. Uh, can you go ahead and say, they got this whole northwest quarter of this next section. I want you to survey that, too. All right, well, look, you just... It doesn't seem like much, you know. The client's like, "It's not that much more expensive, is it?" Well, yeah, it is. Now you got to, now you got your limits of control now include that whole other quarter section, right? Plus whatever's up here. So yeah, it makes a real big difference. You got to be careful in sectionalized land because your limits of control get really big really fast. Okay, now let's talk about a couple things. I want to talk about this center quarter and how it relates to limits of controlling element, and I want to talk about something that guys do that drives me crazy. Okay, so here's what a lot of guys will do. They'll show a parcel in a section, an aliquot parcel, and they'll do something funky like this. They'll come over and they'll tie a section corner and they'll come down and they'll tie a quarter corner, varying in distance. That's all you get. They don't show you any other controlling corners of the section, quarter corners, section corners, or the center quarter. This is almost as bad as deed staking, in my opinion. At a minimum, if you're surveying in sectionalized land, you better at least be showing your quarter section. And I would argue you, sh you should, and I, I wish they would make this the law, you should show your quarter section and the opposing quarter corners. Right? So let's talk about why that is. At a minimum, in other words, you should never see a public land survey section Public land, you should never see a survey in a public land survey section where the sur retracing surveyor hasn't at least tied out the quarter corner. The quarter section, sorry. Okay, so let's talk about why you need these opposing quarter corners. By law, the center quarter was not set. It's the intersection of these lines. Okay, now, I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, lane in the manual doesn't count after the lane goes to private ownership, da, 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 and I agree with some of that, but I just, I want to give you an example. Let's say you've got a corner here. This is why it's so important to understand corner history. So you got a corner here and you find these four. You can, you might say, well, this isn't in my limits of controlling elements. I got a monument here. Okay, well, that may or may not be true. You got to understand the history of this property corner monument. So let me give you a, an example of where I think it does, it may limit your limits of controlling elements and an example where it doesn't. Let's say that this corner's been in the ground for 70 years and it matches old physical occupation. So you got some fences here that have been, been around a long, long time, and all the landowners agree that's the corner. Um, then what I, you know, I think it's the wrong thing to do is to, is to <coughs> tie these four quarter corners, run that intersection, and set your corner for this quarter over here, you know, five feet away. That's bad. Don't do that. Okay. But, and here's my argument, even if you've got a good, good corner with good pedigree that's been in the ground for a long, long time and has been accepted by the whole neighborhood, you don't want to probably disrupt that corner. But you should still, as a matter of due diligence, tie out these opposing quarter corners and check the math. You want to know how far away is that corner from the true intersection of the opposing quarter corners. And show it to me on your survey. And if you find that this long-standing corner of good, good pedigree is five feet away from the intersection, tell me that on the map. Say, this existing monument's five feet from the actual mathematical intersection, but it's got good pedigree and it's been in the ground for a long, long time, and that's what I held. I'm going to look at that map and go, good call, good decision. But a lot of guys will just accept this monument and not tell me. They won't even check the opposing quarters. They're not going far enough out on their, on their limits of controlling elements. Jeff Lund taught me this, by the way. Kudos to Jeff Lund. I had a survey in section 23. He maybe checked my opposing corners. He was a good surveyor. Okay? So don't do this. Don't just give me one or two ties to a couple corners on the exterior of your section. Not good enough. You at least got to break down your quarter, and you should be tying out the opposing quarters. Okay, at a minimum. All right, so just to review, resolve boundary matrix, RBM. It's so one of the best tools you can have as a, as a boundary surveyor. Layer one is your subject parcel or parcels. Layer two is your adjoining parcel or parcels. At least pull these deeds, check for conflicting calls or gaps and overlaps in the record. And then think about your limits of control, the limits of controlling elements. As a general rule, as you move down the pyramid, 
the, the footprint of these two things gets bigger, right? So your adjoining parcel footprint's bigger than your subject parcel. Your limits of controlling elements probably bigger than your adjoining parcels. Now, just to get back to, before we wrap up, just to, to get back to the estimating part, here's what I want you to remember. These two things are generally known when you prepare your estimate. This is generally not known. You can get an idea of what it is if you do some lands record research, but you're not going to know the limits of your controlling elements typically until you've done some field work and, and figured out what evidence you have in the ground. So there's some risk here, and you have to think about how you're going to appropriately assess that risk and handle it in your contract with your client, in your scope of services with your client, how you're going to get compensated for that risk. Okay, and don't forget, in public land surveys, this gets big real fast. So in that dimension, public land, public land survey system surveys can be more risky. Risky in the sense of you lose your rear end because you don't have enough time in your estimate for your field work. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it.